Welcome into the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. I'm Tim McMaster. A little bit of a special edition here of the Chatting Cage as we get ready for the 4 o'clock Eastern Time trade deadline. So stepping into the cage, we have a couple of guys who will have plenty of information about the trade deadline. MLB.com's Jim Duquette. He's been through it all as part of a front office. MLBpipeline.com's Jonathan Mayo, who has all the information on the prospects. Guys, thanks so much for stepping into the cage. How are you, Tim? Always a pleasure. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be on the air for 30 minutes here, so get your questions in. You know how to do it. Use that hashtag chatting cage to get your question in on Twitter. You can use the MLB Fans app. You can also click that Get In Line button and get on the air. Ask your own question of Jim and Jonathan. Uh, guys, we're going to start, though, with Twitter, and we'll start kind of broad here. Jim, this one for you. Okay. Ravens Orioles OD wants to know, what are the biggest trade-related surprises you've seen so far this season? You know, uh, I think that uh, there haven't been too many surprises. I would say that the big surprise probably are Yankee-related, both because, you know, their intention wasn't to trade. They were going to buy, and because they've been right around 500 this year, they moved both Chapman and Miller. And I think Brian Cashman did a great job because it's been a seller's market. He really took advantage of the fact that he could get back four pieces for both players, both pitchers, and still has a viable uh, closer in Betances uh, to close out games. So I think Brian Cashman of the one that the surprises for me, Chapman, Miller, and really more Miller than Chapman because Chapman's going to be a free agent. Miller was under a controllable contract for the next couple of years. Am I allowed to weigh in on a question? A absolutely. Okay. You guys, if you want to both take a shot they at can anything, tag. I, uh, go right ahead. I know. I, 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 I think the, uh, I, I mean, uh, probably the biggest surprise of all of that is now we're talking about the Yankees possibly having the best farm system in baseball, which is, it, it's not, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Um, it'll be interesting to see what they had. I think if I were to pick a surprise, it's also Yankee related because they, they were doing all the selling. And then they went and traded for Tyler Clippard, right, which right. I know they probably felt they needed to have an arm in, in the big league bullpen. Uh, Campos is not like a big, big name, but he was a pretty good arm. So that, that was a little bit of a surprise given what they were doing. But I agree with, with Jim. I think that the Yankees did extremely well. Uh, and, you know, using the, the fact that Miller does have those years of control helped them bring in uh, some, some really good talent in that trade. And it had already been an improved system, and it just kind of gives it another jolt. Absolutely. Jonathan, I'm going to stick with you here. Uh, B. Hoffy on the MLB Fans app wants to know, what would the Red Sox need to give up to acquire sale in your mind? You guys can both jump in on that. Sure. But on the prospect side of things, Jonathan, what types of talent down there on the farm for the Red Sox would they have to give up? Well, I mean, keep in mind that uh, they've traded a good amount of their system to San Diego uh, already. So, uh, But they, they, they would have to part, I think, with one of their, their top two guys. Uh, so you know, either Yoan Mankata or Andrew Benintendi. Um, I know John Heyman tweeted out something that would they give up both. Uh, if that's what the White Sox are asking for, I hang up the phone if I'm the Red Sox. I don't give up both of those guys. But I think that given who Chris Sale is, uh, they would have to give up one of those guys, uh, you know, and, and then some probably uh, of their middle range guys. And they still have some talent to, in, in that system to, to choose from. But uh, I don't think the White Sox would, would deal Sale if... Mankata or Ben and Ted D aren't involved. Yeah, totally agree. I think the White Sox, interestingly, it doesn't look like they're going to move him now because, you know, listen, they were out there shopping him, as they should be. At this time, you know, if you, if you want teams to overpay for him, they were asking for top, four top guys or, you know, when I say top guys, I mean at varying levels, but it was absolutely going to have to be at least one of the guys that Jonathan mentioned. Probably a Rafael Devers is mm -hmm. another name and then two others in addition to that. And if you're the Red Sox, you're looking at, boy, that's expensive. Yeah, you control sale, but the controllable pieces, the guys that you have that are quality under control for a long period of time, I'm not so sure that that makes sense. And I don't even know if they match up. You know, I don't know how, how much the White Sox really in the end wanted to move sale. That, to me, is the biggest uh, issue right now. I, I think you listen you know, to offers, and you, you ask for the moon, but you only move them if you get the moon. Right. right? You're not going to suddenly decide, okay, well, that's close enough. We're going to do it. I think they can set, you know, the market, so to speak, and say, this is what we want with whatever team they're talking with. And if they don't get it, then they just hold on to them, and they can always try again in the offseason or next season if they feel that they need to move them. Absolutely. There's time to do that, or there's time to, to try to get things turned around behind him with the White Sox. Absolutely. That's going to be a thing we're going to be following here over the next four hours. We will uh, head back to Twitter and... 
we will check out Fantasy GM 18. This one's for you as well, Jim. Okay. In your experience as a GM, how did these final few hours before the deadline usually play out? I guess the, the question there is, how much are you on the phone? How yeah. do those conversations go? Well, this, this is the, the last four hours are really, it's the cat and mouse that you know, you've been going through for the last week, two weeks. It's now f- coming to its final conclusion. And you can get some deals done. A lot of times the price tag comes down at the end. There's been some high prices out there on a Jeremy uh, Hellickson uh, or uh, Jeffress with Milwaukee, uh, Genmark Gomez. I mean, understandably so because it's a seller's market. What you end up seeing mm-hmm. is some of these teams who haven't done anything yet, the Rangers and the Dodgers, you know, the teams that are in the mix, they end up looking at and waiting for that price tag. It's kind of an art there, but hope, hoping, expecting the price tag to come down a little bit, and then you end up uh, making a deal that way. But you have to really be prepared have a good sense of the marketplace. I think now that Bruce is gone, that's going to clarify things a little bit more on what you can get for Reddick or what it's going to cost you for Reddick and what it's going to cost you for Beltron. And that's how these things work. Now when you see another reliever go a little bit later, then it'll set the market for the next core group. So we saw a pretty expensive piece there for Andrew Miller go, but there's no other closer out there like right. Andrew Miller. So I think you, you work from there, and, you know, Jeffress is the next guy with a hot, lot of saves, and same with Gomez, but they're not going to be able to get the same amount as Chapman or Miller. I'm curious, you know, it seems that each year, Jim, uh, there's more and more post-non-waiver deadline moves. Yeah, that's true. If you're a general manager, are you less likely to, to blink as it used to be the case because it seems that it's a little bit easier to, to, to get things done if you need to a- after this first deadline? Yeah, I, you know, that's a good point. I think when they go through now, so then you start putting guys through waivers, and there's a lot of teams that are blocking, uh, and there's a strategy to that too. So you don't see, you don't see major guys get through, but you do see guys, uh, certain names get through. And, and, and so I do think that there is something there. Like uh, we saw, I think, last year with the Mets, with Clippert, I believe, he got through, that's and right. they made that deal in August. So there are good, good names out there. Uh, you do have to, uh, you know, kind of pick and choose your 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 spots there, though. Um, and it's not quite as uh, uh, you know, there's not quite as many na- uh, names that are available to you, obviously. So, yeah, I do think you'll see a plenty like you like you said, Jonathan, where uh, moves are made in August. You know, another whatever half a dozen or more moves probably during the month. And it certainly seems like the asking prices for these big name players has gone up and up and up, and maybe the value of of prospects is kind of on the rise. Guys, we're going to go back to the MLB Fans app, and this is a question that at this point I think we know the answer to, but it'll let us get into that answer a little bit. Baseball 37 wants to know, will the Mets make a move before the 4 o'clock deadline? And it looks like they have guys with with Jay Bruce. So let's get into that. Jim, how much do you know about this deal that looks like it's going to happen with Jay Bruce and the Mets? Well, the Mets have been talking to the Reds about Bruce. Uh, They were also talking to the Brewers about Lucroy, but... That price tag has continued to stay real high on Lucroy. Bruce, not so much. And it looks like they're going to go ahead and get this deal done. Now, there's been debate on who's going to be in the deal, so we're not quite sure yet. I've heard Brandon Nimmo's name for sure. Uh, that's something that you have to wait and see, the, the rest of them. But I've heard it's three players in particular. It's interesting to me is, you know, Bruce, you look at that, they, they don't really have a spot. Center field is really the need. Lagares is out now. Conforto's been playing center field, but I do think it's going to push Granderson to center field, Bruce to right, Cespedes to left. Cespedes has been dealing with those, uh, a couple of those injuries there to his hip and his leg, his hammy. So, uh, but it does sound like this is going to be do- uh, going to get done. They're on the verge of it, and Bruce will really help when it comes to hitting with runners in scoring position, as we know Mets have been last in baseball all, all, almost all season. That's not going to be the prettiest outfield that you've seen. It's not going to be the best def- uh, defense, no. so I would agree with no. that. I mean, having Conforto in center to, to begin with, I mean, effort is certainly there, but he's not a center fielder. Right. And uh, I think Granderson's days as a, as a center fielder are gone. So they, they, they better hit is basically what it comes that's down right. to. How about uh, Jonathan? How about Nimmo? If it sounds like he's at least the guy that's involved in this. And we've seen him at the Major League level uh, this season making his debut. Uh, he was drafted out of high school, I know. The Mets liked him a lot. He he went through the minors. He kind of hit every stop along the way. Is he ready to go to Cincinnati and step right into the big league club at this point? I think so. Uh, you know, uh, it remains to be seen what his ceiling is. You know, a lot of people see him as kind of a tweener. Maybe he's a fourth outfielder. But I think he could be a really good fourth outfielder. Uh, he's got a really advanced approach at the plate. He's going to draw walks. Uh, you know, how much power he has, I think, will dictate what he is uh, regularly. What you will get, though, is an unbelievable clubhouse guy, 
a guy who's going to play hard uh, every second that he's on a, on a major league field and whatever role he has. Uh, so as the Reds kind of try to, to flip things over with some young talent, I think he's the kind of guy who eventually probably would even grow into a leadership role. Um, you, you saw the, the, the energy and enthusiasm that he brought to the field once he got called up. Um, you know, I know people have been wondering, like, well, why is it taking him so long? If you keep in mind that he was drafted at a high school uh, and didn't have a high school team, I actually think he's gotten to the big leagues faster uh, than expected. And that advanced approach is something that was a bit surprising, uh, given how little baseball he had kind of played during his high school days. But uh, uh, plus plus makeup guy, and it just remains to be seen, you know, whether he's more than a fourth outfielder or a guy who can play every day, probably in a corner. You know, Tim, one other thing on that is, I think Cincinnati is a perfect spot for Nimmo because they have a ton of pitching, young pitching. They don't have a lot of position players, young position players, and they're going to play them. So, so to answer Jonathan's question, a lot of times you need to play, and if you're in a pennant race like the Mets and he goes in a little funk like you see on occasion, it's harder for them to keep him in the lineup. Right. Cincinnati is going to have some patience with him and go ahead and give him a look. So we'll see. He's a top-of-the-lineup type of hitter, on-base percentage guy. Like he said, an advanced approach. We'll see if the power comes, but... I think it's a, a good move for Cincy. Yeah, I think the one guy who's probably not real happy about this trade is Jesse Winker. Oh, uh, Winker's only yeah, he's one of their top you know top prospects. Uh, hasn't had a great year, but it's starting to come on a little bit, and he's a guy I've been waiting for them to give that opportunity to. And you know, if they hadn't acquired a guy like Nimmo, I would have called Winker up and let him play right field every day and see you know and see what happens. I actually thought he would have ended up the left fielder, but uh, no one saw what Adam Duvall was going to do this year. Great stuff, guys. There you have it. You get both sides of the trade, the prospect side, the move from both teams. Uh, This is the Edward Jones chatting cage. Get in line. Press that button. Get on the air like this fan that's joining us now. Go ahead. Tell us your name, where you're from, and go ahead with your question. All right, so my name's Cruz, and I wanted to know if the Houston Astros should uh, trade for Chris Sale or Carlos Beltran. Well, I'll tell you, from, from the offensive side, I, it doesn't seem like, and I've talked to A.J. Hinch, their manager, every week and um, on, my, on my show on the radio side, and, he, he, and they don't feel like they need an offensive piece. They need pitching. So I think Beltran, and maybe they decided to go after Beltran, but right now it seems like they're going to go with Bregman, who they just brought up, right. and the Guriel. Uh, uh, kid, the Cuban uh, uh, player that they're going to play in left field or uh, probably in left field who uh, is an experienced guy. They're going to bring him up. And then it, I think they need pitching personally. Starting pitching would be great. I don't think they're in on sale. I, it's going to be a real expensive ask there too. But I, I know that they've been a sleeper team and everyone's kind of expecting in the industry for them to make a big deal. Yeah, I mean, they, they are one of the teams that have pieces to trade. Uh, obviously, they're not going to trade Alex Bregman, but they have some other guys. I think they have enough of the DH kind of players within their own, either in the system or already on the big league level, uh, that I don't know that Carlos Beltran would be, uh, be the right fit, at least not for any kind of, kind of hefty price. Whether or not they have the high-end prospects to get Chris Sale, um, you know, they would probably have to trade Bregman. Uh, but, you know, they've got Francis Martez. They've got, you know, they've got uh, David Paulino. They've got some young arms that would probably be of interest to some teams if they wanted to go out and, and even get a, a, a non-Chris Sale starting pitcher. Seems like everybody needs pitching, guys. Some starters, Always. some relievers. And one team that I think you could say won the trade deadline a year ago was the Toronto Blue Jays. So we go back to Twitter for a question over there. Naden Canadian wants to know, Will the Blue Jays acquire another pitcher or fall empty-handed? Well, I know this from uh, talking to them, both, both uh, Ross Atkins, Mark Shapiro, John Gibbons. They're looking for starting pitching because they got to move Aaron Sanchez to the bullpen at some point because of the innings pitch limit. So they've been knocking the door on Hellickson out of Philly. Uh, they were knocking on the door on Rich Hill. Uh, Rich Hill's certainly been dealing with this blister, but they could go down that road. We know they've had plenty of conversations over the years uh, in trades already they pulled off the trade for Donaldson not so long ago so uh, I do think that Toronto is going to find a starting pitcher before the end of the day yeah I think one of the things that makes it difficult is that there's a long line you're saying everyone needs pitching you know you know so the Astros are looking for a starting pitcher Uh, everyone knows that the Pirates have been looking for starting pitching and you haven't heard their name other than when they dealt Mark Melanson away uh, and, and, you know, they're not necessarily giving up on this season. So there are a lot of teams looking for that starting pitcher, not necessarily a Chris Sale-level starting pitcher. 
and frankly, there aren't that many on the market to, to go get. So I think maybe we end up hearing a, a starting pitcher name or two that we haven't heard much from that ends up getting dealt to, to one of these teams when all is said and done. All right, back to Twitter here, guys. And, and this one, I guess, Jonathan, you can start up on this one. Uh, Yanks fan 27, and when you hear the question, you'll know why it's a Yankees fan, wants to know which prospects dealt so far could be the biggest difference makers for their new teams. Well, he probably wants me to start with the with the with the Yankees, and I, and I think that makes sense. I mean, they, you know, they brought in now their top two prospects in Clint Frazier in the Andrew Miller trade and Gleyber Torres in the uh, Araldis Chapman trade. Uh, you know, Frazier will get there first. Uh, he's already in Triple A. Uh, I think Yankee fans are going to enjoy him. Uh, he plays. Uh, like his hair is on fire. And he's going to have to cut it, though. He though. is going to have to cut that, oh, yes, the, that hair. Uh, maybe locks for love, you know, so he can <laughs> donate it. But uh, he, he probably has enough. But uh, he plays extremely hard. And what he's managed to do in the last year and a half is kind of channel that energy. He used to be kind of an all-or-nothing kind of player. Uh, he works counts better. He hits to all fields. The power is legit. I think he's a 2020 kind of guy. Um, so I think... He's probably first in line, um, but I think you know all the big names that they got. Uh, Gleyber Torres is you forget, he's only 19. He started this year really slow, but he was in the Carolina League at age 19, so he's way ahead of the curve. He's gotten better at shortstop, so I think he sticks there. And then keep an eye on Justice Sheffield. I'll stick with all Yankees to to, to make uh, this guy happy. Uh, Justice Sheffield is the lefty they got from Cleveland in the Andrew Miller trade. I like him a lot. Uh, pitches with a chip on his shoulder because he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's been told he's not big enough, but he's got three above average to plus pitches, uh, a lot of life on the fastball. If he can throw enough strikes, you know, he, he's a starting pitcher, and he'll probably move to double-A next year, so he's not even that far away. This is the Edward Jones Chatting Cage, Jim Duquette, Jonathan Mayo joining us. We're talking trade deadline as little over three hours to go until the Doors close on the non-waiver trade deadline. We have another fan ready to go. Go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi, I'm Hank Roberts from Phoenix, Arizona. And I was wondering, what is the status of the Arizona Diamondbacks at the deadline? Are they trying to rebuild, or they've made some interesting moves here? They've made some interesting moves. Dave Stewart, Tony La Russa uh, basically are... Uh, are in asking mode. I think they're 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 talking about uh, selling a piece or two, but nothing major. I think I've heard Daniel Hudson's name here recently. I already traded Brad Ziegler. Uh, they were open at one point of tr to trading Shelby Miller, but there hasn't been a lot of interest because he has not pitched well. So uh, just recently, Dave Stewart said he there he is not going to be traded. So you know, I think that what they're trying to do is kind of pick up the pieces from a disappointing season. Uh, trade off some of the, we'll call them the fringes, guys that are uh, out there as free agents at the end of this year, and then push the reset button and hope that it gets better next year with their starting pitching. Yeah, I don't know that they have the personnel to make that big uh, splash to bring in a ton of prospects kind of kind of trade. I could see some of their guys being dealt after the, after the deadline. Those mm -hmm. are the kind of guys that get pushed through waivers. And then just see how some of the young pitchers do. You know, let Archie Bradley continue to throw every fifth day. Let Braden Shipley continue to throw every fifth day. Uh, those are sort of the acquisitions that they made. And, and you'll get a really nice long look because those are the guys that are going to have to help them hit that reset button next year. Guys, Cubs fans obviously are locked in right now. We're going to go back to the MLB fans app and, and, they traded away Gleyber Torres. Obviously, that was a big-time prospect that, that had the talent, but who knows where he would have fit into that Chicago team. Uh, Namoli Green wants to know, how are the top Cubs prospects doing so far this year, and which of them do you think has the best shot to make it at the major league level? Uh, Jonathan, we've seen a lot of them already make it to the major league level the last few years, but who's next? Probably, I guess, Ian Happ. Um, you know, without looking at the, at, the, at the top 30, but he's at the top of their list, and he, you know, uh, he's a, you know, a college hitter uh, taken you know, in the 2015 draft who's, who's moved quickly, uh, and he is another guy that you don't necessarily know where he's going to play. Um, he's Jimenez playing, is another guy. So. Well, oh, Eloy Jimenez is tremendous, but he's down in low A ball, um, so it's going to take him a little while. Uh, he's hitting 342 now. 
Uh, I'd like to see him get promoted maybe near the end of the year, especially if they're in a playoff race in the Carolina League. I don't know where that stands. They did that with Torres last that's year. Right, they moved right. him up, and he was tremendous. He helped them win a Carolina League championship. So you might see the, the same kind of thing. Jimenez is, is, is terrific. Hap is probably the next bat. You know, it's, it's still more hitters than, than pitchers, but Hap is the, is the next bat. But he's been playing second base. I mean, where, I, I'm not, he's another one of those guys. Where is he going to fit in at the big league level? So uh, he could be one of those guys that probably would be attractive to some, some other teams just because he's an advanced college hitter with some power. Good problem to have, though, Jim, right? Nowhere to put these guys? Well, and most of, the, <laughs> a lot, most of their top prospects they brought up to the right, big right. leagues. You know, and so you know, that, that's hard. And they have plenty still left. They traded, you know, that's why they traded four for Chapman. But it, is, it does take a little bit of a reset in the minor leagues, too, when you have that much kind of movement to the major leagues and then, of course, uh, a couple, you know, a trade like that. I do think, interestingly, the, the Cubs may make one more move. They were hunting for starting pitching and upgraded starting pitching, which is not likely to happen. But they may add a, a, a bat corner outfield, like, say, left field. Like a Josh Reddick has certainly been rumored as a possibility of going there since he's a free agent at the end of the year in Oakland, and, and the Cubs have have done uh, deals in the past. All right, this is the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Still time to get your questions in. Use the hashtag Chatting Cage. You can also use the MLB Fans app or get in line like this fan has done. Uh, go ahead, fan, with your name, where you're from, and go ahead with your question. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm from Toronto. And uh, my question for you guys is whether you guys think the Jays have some interest still in trading Jose Bautista and if maybe Jose Bautista would be willing to waive his 10-5 rights. Uh, I don't believe that they're going to move Jose Bautista at, at this point. Um, and, and like you said, he's got a ten, he's a 10-5 guy, which is 10 years in the big leagues, five with the same team. It gives him no, a no trade provision. The tricky part, and we just saw it with Lucroy on a limited basis, is the Blue Jays could go down the road of making a, some kind of deal for Bautista. Bautista could say, there's no chance I'm going there. I won't accept it. And now he's upset and mad that the front office tried to trade him. I think if there was ever a window to do it, it would have been in the wintertime. But I don't think that there's a chance that he's going to get traded now. What do you think? I mean, the right way to do it would be with him, you know, in terms Include of from, 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 from the get-go. And now right. I know with the, with the Lucroy situation, uh, there was some of that. And then, you know, he, the, the message he got from the Indians was not what he liked, right. at least according to what he said. And we don't need to debate uh, whether he should have gone or not. That's right, right. Uh, but you know, I think the only way you could do something like that is really kind of in concert with a player, really out of respect for for a guy like Jose Bautista and what he's meant to that organization. Um, you know, but to trade him away at this point while they're you know at the top of the A, at least uh, I don't right. think it, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, that window is only <laughs> going to be open for so much longer for Toronto. Right. Uh, you got to keep all those bats in that lineup uh, at least as long as you can. All right, we're going to go back to Twitter here, and hashtag trades wants to know, who do you think have been the biggest winners of the trade deadline so far? This is kind of a, an overall question. We talked about surprises, guys, yeah. but how about just flat-out winners? And this can be either way, buyers or sellers. Yeah, it's always hard you know, right now because we haven't seen it all. But so far, you know, and again, if you want to do you count the whole week or do you count the whole month, you know, for, for an example, you know, what the Red Sox have done over the last few weeks since the All-Star break, getting Brad Ziegler and Drew Pomerantz. That should count as a deadline. You know, you're in the month of July. It counts for deadline deals. So I think that they certainly were better. Andrew Miller getting him for Cleveland, that's a huge deal. And I think the Yankees overall, the number of prospects they got. Right now, and I have to write a piece for MLB.com at the end of the day for the three top winners, they would be my three winners, but I think there's still a lot of movement to, to happen. Yeah, obviously, I look at it from the prospect standpoint. So the, what the Yankees have been able to do, I think they've done a very, very good job in terms uh, of leveraging the value of their players. The extra control for Andrew Miller, uh, I think, certainly helped them bring in uh, more talent. Uh, to, you know, to bring in four players to, for, for a relief pitcher, to me, is, is a really good get. And I'll add something to the Indians being winners. You know, not only did they get Andrew Miller, but they may look back at the fact that they didn't get Jonathan Lucroy as, as a win uh, because of who they didn't end up trading. And when Francisco Mejia is ready to be their everyday catcher at the big league level, they may decide, oh, phew, you know, thank, thank goodness. You know, meanwhile, you know, he's got a 42-game hitting streak going in, in the minors. And people don't, don't realize quite how good he might end up being. 
Uh, I'm not saying that it wouldn't have been worthwhile for them to bring in Lucroy to go for it right now. They weren't giving up top, top prospects. They didn't have to give up Bradley Zimmer. That's another win for them that they were able to hold on to one of those guys. But sometimes it's the trades you don't make that end up, uh, end up being the best ones. Guys, looks like uh, we may have another big deal kind of brewing or, or about to go down. Josh Reddick and Rich Hill uh, reported by Ken Rosenthal to the Dodgers. Jarrell Cotton going the other way. I want to get your thoughts on that in a second. But first, we have a fan on the line ready to go. Uh, fan, just tell us your name, where you're from, and go ahead with your question. Hi, I'm Matt from Long Island. Um, um, which prospects do you guys think will have a big contribution down the line in their careers? I know we keep going back to, to the Yankees, but, uh, you know, why don't I start with the Padres and talk about Anderson yeah. Espinosa for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, that's interesting. You know, uh, it's very clear that A.J. Preller likes high upside, high ceiling players. He, he went after them aggressively when he was uh, in charge of international scouting for the Rangers. Uh, since he's tried to hit the reset button, the farm system of the Padres, that's what he's gone after. And Anderson Espinosa has an electric arm, but he's in low A. And he's a six-foot right-hander, so it kind of you have to wait and see what happens. Advanced feel for three above-average to plus pitches, though, for for an 18-year-old. So he's kind of the one that's uh, exciting to see what he does. And then obviously the Yankees guys, uh, you know, Clint Frazier of all of them will probably be the first one to 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 hit the big leagues. Guys, let's go back to that trade real quick. Um, it, it's being reported, Reddick and Hill and and Duke. You mentioned once Jay Bruce was off the board, we may see Reddick go quickly. I, this is very quickly, but uh, yeah. uh, Jarrell Cotton going uh, the other way to Oakland. So uh, first deal as a whole, obviously the Dodgers had to add some pitching with, with the up-in-the-air situation of Clayton Kershaw and the outfielder, a huge lift as well. So the Dodgers get two pieces in one deal, Duke. Well, they fill two spots, and, and it doesn't happen very often with the same team, but this is one of those where the Dodgers stayed on top of Oakland. They had a good sense of the marketplace because uh, o Oakland was not getting the, uh, the hits on both Hill and Reddick that they were hoping. And so they proposed lumping the two together. Uh, Oakland gets back some pieces back in return. I don't think that'll be the only name that you hear going back to Oakland uh, from the sounds of it, although, although we don't know yet the, all, the, all the details. But from, from the Dodgers side of things, they needed help in the rotation. Hill definitely does that. And their offense, even though it's been going uh, well lately, they needed a boost. Reddick's a perfect fit, and he could play both corners if they needed. And uh, Jonathan, Jarrell Cotton, uh, right-hander in AAA right now, uh, what kind of upside does he have? He's got good upside. He pitched in the Futures game, and uh, you know I think it makes sense for Oakland because he's an upper-level guy, so they're going to get a return on their investment. Uh, rather quickly, uh, you know, whether it's at, you know, ends up in the bullpen or not, we'll have to wait and see. But it's a, it's a good arm. Seems like a fairly low risk trade for the Dodgers, uh, but they're getting guys, you know, especially Rich Hill dealing you know, with some of the issues he had. Uh, there are some question marks. So it's not like they're going to be giving up uh, Alex Verdugo or, or Cody Bellinger in a, in, a, in a trade like that. So they were able to upgrade without uh, dipping too much into what's a pretty deep farm system. And that's how this works, guys. You, you can get a trade. It happens. We talk about it. You can ask questions about it. All here on the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Just get in line, and we have another fan ready to go. Hey, fan, how you doing? Just go ahead, tell us your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi, I'm Liam from Long Island, and this is for both of you guys. Who do you think would be a good um, outfielder other than Nimmo to be on the Reds uh, if they trade away Bruce? Well, it sounds like they they ha have all but traded away uh, mm -hmm. Bruce. Uh, so uh, you'll get to know Brandon Nimmo if you're a Reds fan. Um, you know, I think I mentioned Jesse Winker, who's in their farm system. I'd like to see him get a chance. Uh, they had Kyle Waldrop, who's been up and down a little bit, but I see him more as a backup kind of guy. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if it's not going to be Nimmo, I would probably say it's Jesse Winker. Yeah, I would say Winker. I would say, obviously, Duvall's already there. Hamilton's right. already there. So... You know, I, I do think, I think um, you know, they have some really good, talented, young uh, outfield right now you know, if, they, if this deal ends up going through like we hear with Nimmo. So um, I think Winker is the other guy that, um, that, that you'll see up there at some point. All right, guys, we're out of time. This flew by 30 minutes on the trade deadline in the chatting cage. Jim Duquette, Jonathan Mayo, thanks so much for taking some time. It's good stuff. Thanks. All right, this has been the Edward Jones Chatting Cage. Tune in again next time.